Now let's embark on a study of DNA structure and let's at first take a historical approach to the discovery of DNA structure. And as, as we've said before, before um, for a long time it was thought that proteins were the, uh, the molecule of heredity, but with the establishment that DNA was indeed the molecule of heredity, the, the molecule that contained genes, um, as demonstrated by Avery McCarty and McLeod, and then by Hershey and Chase, a race was on really to discover DNA structure. And the race was between mainly, may, not exclusively, but mainly between two labs in England, the um, uh, a lab in, at King's College London, and then labs at the uh, lab at the Cavendish Laboratories in Cambridge. And you will remember that the building blocks of DNA are uh, nucleotides, and nucleotides are composed of three components: the a, a ribose sugar containing an oxygen and five carbons. One, two, three, four, five. Um, in the case of DNA, the five carbon sugars, the ribose sugar, a ribose is a five carbon sugar. The ribose sugar lacks a hydroxyl group on the two prime carbon. So here's the one prime carbon, two prime carbon, three prime carbon, four prime carbon, and five prime carbon. The two prime carbon lacks a hydroxyl group and only has a hydrogen, only has hydrogens attached to that carbon. That is in DNA. In RNA, ribonucleic acid, the uh, two prime carbon has a hydroxyl group on it. So here we have deoxyribose, meaning minus the hydroxyl group on the two prime carbon. So a, there is a five prime, there's a five carbon sugar in every nucleotide building block of DNA. And there's a phosphate group in every nucleotide. And then there's a nitrogenous base, one of four nitrogenous bases in DNA, adenine, guanine, A, G, or cytosine, thymine, C, T. Um, and in RNA, uracil is found instead of thymine as one of the uh, nucleotide nitrogenous bases. So we find uracil in RNA, not DNA, and we find thymine in DNA, not RNA. And cytosine and thymine, as you can see, are single ring, uh, single aromatic ring nitrogenous bases. Um, and they are pyrimidines, whereas the dual ring guanine and adenine nitrogenous bases are purines. And this much was known about DNA structure, and the basic structure of the nucleotide building blocks was known that there was a nitrogenous base that was linked through a glycosidic bond to the one prime carbon, that the ribose sugar lacked a hydroxyl group on the two prime carbon, and then there attached to the five prime carbon, there was a phosphate group. Um, and that the nucleotides were most likely uh, linked together through phosphodiester linkages. We'll study this shortly in, in a little more detail. Um, and the, one of the labs, the lab at King's College London that was run by Maurice Wilkins, uh, had a postdoctoral researcher, Rosalind Franklin, uh, who was studying the structure of DNA and hoped to determine the structure of DNA in cells by virtue of X-ray crystallography, which consists of a technique whereby long fibrous DNA, um, long fibers of DNA are, are um, illuminated, if you will, by X-rays. And the atoms in the fibrous DNA will scatter electrons, um, I'm sorry, will scatter the X-rays rather, and to produce a pattern of X-ray diffraction that can be interpreted uh, in terms of the position of atoms in the molecule. Now, this technique can, used to be, uh, back in the early 1950s when Franklin was working, this technique was extremely labor-intensive because the uh, mathematics necessary to decipher or to decode an X-ray um, crystallograph into atomic positions of atoms in the molecule was extremely complex. There was a lot of mathematics, Fourier transforms, and this all at the time had to be done by hand. There weren't computers around to do that, those calculations. Today, we have computational methods to analyze X-ray crystallographs and, um, and structure determination.
based on X-ray crystallography proceeds at a very rapid pace uh, today. But Franklin did not have uh, th that type of computational power at her fingertips, so she was doing this all by hand. And Franklin had, had obtained this particular X-ray crystallograph, which shows kind of an X uh, pattern of X-ray um, diffraction, an X-ray diffraction pattern that is in an X pattern. And the other group that was working on determining the structure of DNA at the Cavendish Labs in Cambridge, England, was Watson and Crick. And they were very interested in determining the structure of DNA, not by collecting data, but rather by model building. And here is a picture of them with their final model of DNA uh, that they de developed. So Watson and Crick had Watson and Crick had a number of uh, interesting data that were, were collected by other people that allowed them to finally be the ones to win the race to the structure of DNA and to determine a plausible model for the structure of DNA. And as we've said, one of the pieces of data that they had available to them was actually an X-ray crystallograph that Rosalind Franklin had obtained. And um, Crick especially knew immediately that this particular pattern of diffraction was very characteristic of what a double helical mo molecule should produce because Crick had actually done theoretical work on what uh, X-ray diffraction patterns of helical molecules should result in. So as soon as Watson and Crick uh, uh, obtained this data from Franklin, they knew that um, they were probably dealing with a double helix. So when, as Watson and Crick proceeded in their work to develop a model of DNA, one, they knew that there was, it was, there was probably a double helix. It was probably a double helix. And this was based on the X-ray data of, of uh, Franklin, of Rosalind Franklin. And without her work, it's, it would have um, undoubtedly taken much longer to determine or a plausible model for the structure of DNA. So that is one piece of data that, that Watson and Crick had, had. They had this uh, classic X-ray uh, crystallograph of DNA fibers, which showed a pattern that should indicate um, a double helical molecule as, as revealed by this X-shaped pattern. Um, in the X-ray crystallograph. Another piece of data that, uh, of Franklin's that they had available to them was the observation by Franklin that 180 degree rotation of the sample produced an equivalent pattern, a pattern that was an X-ray diffraction pattern that was equivalent to the original pattern. And they immediately realized that if DNA were double helices, that composed of two single strands of DNA associated with each other, that this data of 180 degree rotation producing equivalent patterns, that must mean that the strands of DNA ran in an anti-parallel direction. And to illustrate what I mean by that, consider just two lines here. And let's say these lines have polarity to them. So we have one end here, and we have an arrow end over here. We have a kind of a tail and a head. Now, if you rotated this pattern 180 degrees, you would get something that looked like this. Flip, you basically flip it 180 degrees. And this would not yield the same X-ray pattern as this would. However, if the strands of DNA were anti-parallel, or in this case, our little lines that we're drawing were anti-parallel, then 180 degree rotation would essentially produce the same pattern because you would have two lines like this now. And then we could flip this, say um, 90 degrees or 180 degrees in the opposite in, in this axis, and we would end up with the original molecule quite easily. So uh, Watson Crick realized that 180 degree rotation would result in the same pattern if and only if the DNA strands in a double helix were to be anti-parallel in their polarity. And we'll discuss that polarity shortly when we examine their model in, in detail.
So they had access to this data of Franklin as well as other data of Franklin's that um, put them on a, a, a the correct path towards building a plausible model of DNA structure. And another piece of data that they had available to them was collected by, this is kind of a third piece of data, was collected by Shargoff, a biochemist at Columbia University. And Shargoff had established Shargoff's rules. He, had, he established rules of DNA that involved the ratios of the different nitrogenous bases in DNA. And what Shargoff did is examine DNA from a variety of species. And although the percentages of the bases in different species might be different, in every species that he examined, the percent of the purine adenine was always equal to the percent of the pyrimidine thymine. And the percent of guanine, the, uh, the, pyrimidine, um, the pyrimidine guanine, was always equal to the percent of the purine cytosine. So the amount of A was always equal to the amount of T, and the amount of G was always equal to the amount of C, no matter what species it was that he examined even though species might differ in their overall content. You might have species 1 here with 40% A and T and 60% G and C. And species 2 might have, let's say, the reverse of that, 60% A and T and 40% G and C. But Within the, those species, the AT content was equivalent and the GC content was equivalent. So in this case, we would have 20% of the nitrogenous bases being A and 20% being T. And here we would have 30% being G and 30% being C. And here those numbers would be uh, reversed. So they had access to Shargoff's rules. And once they determined, once they found out from a, a, a casual conversation with another biochemist that the forms of the nitrogen spaces in DNA were the, um, in the keto arrangement and the amino re arrangement versus what had previously been published was the enol arrangement of the um, nitrogenous bases and the amide forms of the nitrogenous bases, once they found out that this was the actual correct type of arrangement uh, of, um, of atoms in the uh, nitrogenous bases, they really had everything they needed to solve the puzzle of DNA structure. And the model that they built is now the famous double helix model that turned out to be correct. So they based their work on others' data, but were very persistent in building models until they finally found a model which, um, which was plausible and consistent with all the available data at the time. And we now know that their model was essentially correct. The model that they built was of the, um, the structure of DNA that is found in aqueous environments. And we know that the internal environment of a cell, of course, is an aqueous water-based environment. Um, dried out DNA assumes a different form than the classical Watson-Crick model. We call this model B-form DNA as opposed to the A-form, um, which gives a different X-ray diffraction pattern when DNA, when dehydrated, gives a, uh, it changes its conformation and gives a different X-ray diffraction pattern. And it was Franklin who named the A-form versus B-form DNA based on her X-ray crystallographs of hydrated versus non-hydrated DNA. And this is the schematic of the Watson and Crick model, just to show the arrangement of the um, phosphate sugar backbones and the nitrogenous bases. So the first thing you'll notice is that, indeed, the sugar phosphate backbones of the two strands composing a DNA double helix are anti-parallel. So if you notice the arrangement of the sugars, you see that the apex oxygens in this right-handed strand of DNA are pointing downward, and the apex oxygens of the ribose sugars on the left-handed strand here are pointing up. And, and that reflects the 3' to 5' prime polarity of these strands. 
So if we were to just follow this right-handed strand down, we would go from a three prime carbon here through four prime, five prime carbon, phosphate, three prime carbon, four prime carbon, five prime carbon, phosphate, and so on. And that this strand would then be running in the three prime to five prime direction and, and would have three prime top to bottom, five prime polarity, three prime to five prime top to bottom polarity. Um, of the sugar phosphate backbone, whereas the opposite exists here. Here we have five prime to three prime polarity top to bottom, or we could say three prime to five prime bottom to top. These then are anti-parallel strands of DNA. And that each nitrogenous base is connected to the first carbon of a, of a ribose sugar to, in, to the nucleotide in which it belongs by a, what we call a glycosidic bond. We'll review this again shortly. And Watson and Crick realized that in the correct uh, forms of the nitrogenous bases, G could always pair with C through three hydrogen bonds. There were appropriate hydrogen bond donors and acceptors for Gs and Cs, and there were likewise appropriate bond donors and acceptors for the A and T base pairs. A and T base pairs having two hydrogen bonds connecting them, and G and C base pairs having three hydrogen bonds that connect them. And in building their model, this was the only way that they could create a model in which the diameter of the molecule was in fact constant and not disrupted and not kind of a, a squiggly type of molecule. And this then was, is a schematic of the Watson-Crick model. And here's another schematic which shows the sugar phosphate backbone Clearly, uh, anti-parallel, as indicated by these arrows, their sugar phosphate uh, backbones have an anti-parallel orientation, and the hydrogen bonds are shown, uh, the hydrogen bonded nucleate, uh, the hydrogen bonded nitrogenous bases, I should say, are shown as kind of rungs of this double helical ladder. And then this is a space filling model of that um, shown below, uh, and this shows that there is uh, two grooves to the double helix, a major groove and a minor groove. And as we'll see, a minor groove is always 180 degrees opposite a major groove. So if you were able to go inside the screen here and peer around this, um, this minor groove, you would find a major groove on the other side. Likewise, if you looked in this major groove and went around to the other side of the molecule, that would be, you would find a minor groove there. So the major and minor grooves are 180 degrees opposite each other and kind of spiral up the double helix as we proceed up the double helix. And the helix, double, the, the B form of DNA is a right-handed double helix, that is the helix spirals in the right-handed direction. So now we're almost ready to tackle DNA replication, but before we do, I'd like to show you, um, go through the, uh, the DNA, B, B form DNA, the structure of B DNA in a little more detail. Um, with some animations uh, of the molecule. So that's where we'll proceed now. So let's begin by reviewing our basic structure of single-stranded DNA. And you may remember that in our example that we had gone over previously, we showed a tetrameric example consisting of four nucleotides joined together through phosphodiester bonds. And focusing in on, for example, the the nucleotide that contains cytosine as its nitrogenous base, we see that cytosine is going to be linked to our ribose sugar. A ribose sugar has one, two, three, four, five carbons and an apex oxygen in the ribose ring here. And the cytosine nitrogenous base shown in red is linked to the ribose sugar through a glycosidic bond which links the, a nitrogen of the nitrogenous base to the first carbon of the ribose sugar. And we'll illustrate that bond right now. So here is our, our glycosidic bond between our nitrogen of the nitrogenous base and the one prime carbon, the first carbon of the ribose sugar. And then if we focus in on the five prime carbon of the sugar, the fifth carbon, we see that it is linked through an oxygen to a phosphorus atom, shown in orange, which is then linked to, through an oxygen to the three prime carbon, the third carbon of the nucleotide uh, 
uh, in the chain above the nucleotide that we are now considering. So then what we see is that on either side of the phosphorus atom are two oxygens and those are ester linkages. So we refer to the connections between nucleotides as phosphodiester linkages. Phosphodiester linkages. So here's the phospho and there's the diester linkages. And you can see that it is those linkages that connect the nucleotides in a single strand of DNA. The nitrogenous bases are not linked to each other in any way except through the sugar phosphate backbone. And you will note that the sugar phosphate backbone has a polarity to it. And that is because if you follow the backbone through, you will see that, for example, in the, in the example we're looking at here, here we have a three prime carbon, an oxygen, phosphorus, oxygen, five prime carbon, four prime carbon, three prime, crime par, three prime carbon, then down through another phosphorus to the five prime carbon. We are running in this direction, we are going five prime to three prime, and the end of this molecule ends in a three prime oxygen attached to the three prime carbon of this molecule. Likewise, the top of this molecule ends in a five prime phosphorus group attached to the five prime carbon of the initial um, nucleotide in this chain going top to bottom. And so we can view this single stranded DNA then as a sugar phosphate backbone shown in purple with the nitrogenous bases linked through glycosidic bond to each ribose sugar in each nucleotide of the chain. But considering the structure now of double-stranded DNA, we can see that we'll color the, the strands of double-stranded DNA differentially here. The nitrogenous bases of one strand are in green and in the other cyan or aqua, and we can see the hydrogen bonds that connects the nitrogenous bases in the center of the molecule. And examining the polarity now of the two strands, we see that they are anti-parallel. One runs five prime to three prime top to bottom, and the other one runs three prime to five prime top to bottom. And you can see that in by looking at the sugars of each chain. Here the apex oxygen points down, and here the, on the other strand the, the apex oxygens of the ribose sugars point up. Again, anti-parallel polarities of the two strands of DNA. And the diameter of DNA, of, double, of, of B DNA, which is the common form of DNA in cells, the diameter is 20 angstroms, an angstrom being 10 times, 1 times 10 to the minus 10th meters. And the distance between base pairs is 3.4 angstroms. So we have a diameter of 20 angstroms and a distance between base pairs of 3.4 angstroms. And the pairing of the nitrogenous bases in the interior part of the helix are always adenine paired with thymine and guanine paired with cytosine. And there are hydrogen bonds that connect the AT base pairs and the GC base pairs. And we can see that illustrated here. And immediately noticeable, as discovered by Watson and Crick, and now confirmed, is that there are two hydrogen bonds that connect adenine and thymine, where are, there are three hydrogen bonds that connect guanine and cytosine. And we see the, re the relevant hydrogen bond donors and acceptors in the appropriate uh, hydrogen bond partners of the base pairs here. Now the AT and GC base pairing results in strand complementarity, whereby one strand of DNA is complementary to the other strand. It's non-identical in that it is in opposite polarity, but it is also non-identical in that the bases on one strand are not the same as the bases on the other strand. Rather, they are complementary in a hydrogen bonding sense. So opposite an A, there was always a T, and opposite a G, shown in green, there was always a C, shown in red. And this complementarity provides the mechanism for DNA replication as discovered by Watson and Crick. It's first mentioned by Watson and Crick in their seminal paper describing the structure of DNA. So this semi-mode, this semi-conservative mode of replication is illustrated here. We'll eliminate one strand for illustrative purposes, 
and we can see that using one strand as a template, a new strand can be built up inserting nucleotides which contain the appropriate hydrogen bonding partner nitrogenous bases that are complementary to the nitrogenous base on the template strand. So one strand will serve as a template and another strand will be synthesized anew using the information present in the template strand to build a new strand in which the bases are complementary to those of the template strand. Now if we look at DNA and look at the attachment of the bases to the sugar phosphate backbone, we see that they are asymmetrical. That is, that, they are, that creates a groove on one side which is wider than a groove on the other side. So here is the minor groove and here is the major groove of DNA and that is because the attachment of the glycosidic or the arrangement of the glycosidic bonds which attaches the nitrogenous bases to the sugar phosphate backbone is not equal it is asymmetric and you can see that by the bond angles illustrated here which creates a situation whereby the distance between the phosphate backbones are is shorter in the minor groove than in the major groove and that means that the edges of the base pair in the, in the major groove are more exposed than in the minor groove. So if you were a protein interacting with DNA, you would find that there is, there are, there's less area of the sides of the bases here to interact with, whereas the major groove uh, affords a much greater opportunity to um, insert and, and interact with, in a stereochemical way, the um, atoms of the bases that are projecting into the major groove. And also, the major groove presents a more complex stereochemical environment for proteins that interact with DNA than does the minor groove. So let's look at that right now. Here we see the major groove. In this case, we have a methyl group attached. And, we, and looking at this TA base pair, we have a methyl group on this thymine a hydrogen bond acceptor on this thymine, and then on the adenine we have a hydrogen bond donor and a hydrogen bond acceptor. So we have CH3, hydrogen bond acceptor, hydrogen bond donor, and acceptor. Whereas in the minor groove we have hydrogen bond acceptor, just a hydrogen atom on this carbon here, and a hydrogen bond acceptor. That is, in terms of the symmetry, we have symmetry of the atoms in the major groove that are available to be recognized by interacting proteins. Whereas in the major groove, there is a pronounced asymmetry. So um, if we were to uh, switch this base pair so that T was on the left and, I'm, I'm sorry, so that A was on the left and T were on the right, in the minor groove, there would still be HA, H, HA. But in the major groove, we would have HA, HD, HA and CH3 going left to right. So let's just imagine that we switched this base pair. Um, and now we have HA, H, HA in the minor groove, but in the major groove we have HA, HD, HA, and CH3. That is, a pro interacting protein would be able to recognize the difference between an AT base pair and a TA base pair in the major groove, but would have difficulty in doing so in the minor groove. And so what we, this, this, then these features of the major and minor grooves represent a situation whereby proteins that interact and bind to DNA by recognizing particular, particular nucleotide sequences usually, but not always, bind into the major groove where there is more exposure of the bases, of the sides of the bases, and there's a more complex stereochemical environment that can be recognized in the major groove as compared to the minor groove. Now the major and minor grooves lie 180 degrees opposite each other, so they spiral opposite each other up the double helix. We see that on one side we have the major groove, on the other side of the bases we have the minor groove. Here's a minor groove, and then here's a major groove, and those grooves spiral around each other as they move through this right-handed helix here. And that is easily observable when we illustrate the molecular surface of DNA. So here we're now illustrating the surface. You can see the major groove and the minor groove, and those rotate around uh, as the helix proceed as you proceed up the helix.
So always opposite a major groove on the 180 degrees opposite is we rotate there will be a minor groove at that position in the axis of the in, in that position of the long axis of the DNA. Minor groove, 180 degrees opposite, major groove. So the, you, that concludes our treatment of DNA structure for the time being. And as you can appreciate, it, the beauty of this molecule is really quite striking. It's an elegant molecule, has wonderful symmetry, and there's something very aesthetically pleasing about the form of the double helix that the human eye just seems to be drawn to. It's, a, it's really quite a beautiful molecule, but at the same time you will notice that in one sense it is also a very monotonous molecule. The double helix goes on and on and on in, a, in the same shape for very, very long stretches, many hundreds and hundreds of thousands of base pairs in the case of a human chromosome, for example. Yet it does contain this monotony, this monotonous molecule, although beautiful, somehow contains the information that allows it to replicate with great fidelity and it allows it to encode uh, the information of genes. It, it, it is able to store information in a chemical sense that can be decoded to produce an organism, to build an organism and build an organism with efficiency and um, with repeatability. So uh, how that happens is going to be the, we will be delving into you know, over the next um, stretch of this class now, and we'll be looking at, at the, the, the ways that DNA information is coded and decoded. And in order to get started, we're going to need to study the mechanism by which DNA is replicated in, um, in detail. So that's what we'll be proceeding with next in the next lecture is talking about DNA replication.